Hey everyone. Hey. Hey, hey, good to see you. How's everyone hey, Mark, doing? How are you? Good, good. Happy New Year, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you. Good to see you. I'm excited to get started. How are you doing? How's the uh the next the next year coming? The new year coming along. All right, all right. Let's get this started. Hey, Grant, get to, great to see you. Facundo, everyone, let's get this started. Uh, hey. All right, cool. So, <laughs> gonna have Esteban as co host. If uh, someone else joins, uh, Esteban, I'm gonna be admitting them. Um, going to be uh, recording this for replay purposes. And uh, with this, let's get this started. So, I'm gonna make this a tad, where is it, smaller. And um, just quick recap, last, uh, before Christmas, we talked a little bit about templates. Um, we're gonna do a series of classes, trying to wrap up the what we started regarding the templates. And we talked, uh, this is started here, right? We talked about the kind of the philosophy of template building and all that. And then when we, uh, we built a small little template and then we improved the sound uh, with, uh, you know, uh, creating the groups, the stems, etc., and adding a few plugins, balance, obviously, balance, panning, reverb, depth, etc. Um, we also talked about the structure and we created the stems. So when we export, we've got everything ready. So we don't have to be uh, doing multi exports and things like this. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the speed because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if our template sounds great. Uh, if we cannot, if uh, if it, is, it it slows down our composing process, so uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so build the template, improve the sound. This is what we did. It's a recap, and today we're gonna be making it more agile so we can compose faster. How we're gonna do this? So we're gonna be. Um, setting up a series of sketching patches and pre-orchestrated and performance type of patches. So I'm, I'm going to be setting up some of these and the others I've already prepared them here. I'll have to curious. Okay, this is started. Um, but let's just start with uh, the sketching patches. What is an, a sketching patch? It's, sketch it's just um, so we can have in Cubase loaded, violins one, violins two, viola, et cetera, right? Uh, but many, many times, orchestral music generally is not just one instrument. It's a, it's a, there's, there's always an orchestration. If we want for the, uh, to add definition to cellos, we're gonna add bassoons sometimes, right? Or if we want um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the strings melody to stand out a little bit more, we're gonna have the strings in octaves. And obviously we can definitely write the melody on violins one and then down an octave or violins two. It just takes more time. And sometimes if we had some of these pre-orchestrated or pre orchestrated type of patches, it would speed up, speed up our composing process. And so that's what we're going to be creating, a series of patches that are pre-orchestrated or so we can compose faster. That's one thing. Also, we're going to create some performance type of patches, uh, which sometimes we will want something like, let's see if this loads quickly. Sometimes we are going to need something like epic horns. And if you listen to music, horns generally when we are when they are performing that epic line, it's not just a big group, it's not just 12 horns. It is also um let's see. How does this sound? Sounds a little bit uh, soft, right? Let's bring it up. In, yeah, okay, thank you. Let's bring it up in volume. It's this guy here. Boom. Where are you? Where did you go? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One second. Most likely here. Give me just one sec. Yes, it went here. And let me go back here. Um, um, um. Full screen. Back to you guys. There you go. All right, we're good. And so now here. So you know these uh these um very typical brass performance like the the 
the kind of like the, the, the forte piano and then crescendo it's that type of thing it's all over um if you're gonna need for that forte piano just just this won't do it's not like, the reason why this works so well is because the the way this patch has been built which is this guy here just trying to make a point here where there is a sforzato or marcato patch without this guy so without with right So we're going to build us, uh, some of these that allow us to compose faster and more efficiently. Okay. And then finally, so we've talked about the pre-orchestrated patches, the violins one and, one and two in octaves, uh, for example, um, or, or the cellos and bassoons, things like this. And then we talked about the performance patches, you know, uh, building the patches in a way that, uh, that help us um, emulate what an orchestral instrument would do uh, instead of having to build it every time. And then finally, sketching patches. And the sketching patch is what we're going to be building, which is sometimes we're going to need something that has... Um, well, let's use this one instead. Give me just one sec. Yeah, easier. No. Where are you? There you go. A series of patches built in stacked. So we have the a certain type of orchestral sound. In this case, it's full orchestra, right? Uh, so there you go. Where am I? Why is it that you don't see me? Uh, do you see me or not? Yes? No? No. No, no, no. We can see you. You cannot see me. You cannot see me. Why is this? You just want, but you, but you can see the screen. Okay, okay. Oh, I know what it is. Okay, I know what it is. Sorry. Let's get rid of this guy. Go back here. Boom. Full screen. The whole thing. Yes. Sorry. I was projecting just one layer. Okay, cool. All right. So hopefully this makes sense. So here's what we're going to be doing today in the class. Number one, we're going to be creating one of these patches. So you see the process um, because it is no... So the reason why this sounds well is because there's some tweaking. It's not just loading the patches and then all of a sudden it sounds good. Um, as you can see here, if I load this one, for example, and we go here to mix. There's a little bit of balancing and panning, as you can see. At least these are the, like the the the, the, the bare minimum. So we're gonna build one of these, and then we're gonna be talking about, and that is for the sketching patches, and then for the pre-orchestrated patches, we're gonna be loading all of this. Okay, and then finally we're gonna be doing a little bit of composing to kind of prove that with this you can compose much faster. Okay. Um, and then we'll take some Q&A that you can ask during the during class as well. Okay. All right, cool. So let's get started. First, we're going to create one of these kind of like big or casual long type of patches. So by the way, um, I am trying to use either either um, free libraries here uh, or Atmos free libraries. So um, I'm going to be using, so when, when we build the template, most of what we used was BBC. Um, as I'm the problem with BBC, there, there, are, there are ways around this, but with BBC, it's just one instrument. You cannot stack instruments like this or like this, this is contact. Um, 
and this is Halion from uh, Steinberg. And you can stack multiple instruments. And that's good, that's great for this purpose, for the purpose that we are talking about today. Um, and so for creating this patch, I'm going to use Nucleus Lite, which is not free, but it's $99. And it's not cheap, but it's not the most expensive library out there. Um, and it includes it even includes choir. But these days, what I would, what you can ask, what we could also use is Musio, uh, which I think is more like not nine or ten dollars a month, which you know month over month it, it is tax and it's not cheap, but also it is um, way more affordable than other options out there. Uh, no affiliation to any of this, so I'm just trying to create a template that's not just. Uh, very usable and creates a good sound, but also almost free. Um, and the same thing with reverbs. Some of the reverbs that I'm using are free. We, we discussed this in the one, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, and the others, I mean, I've used some paid reverbs, but not try to use reverbs that are not over a hundred dollars. Um, so we use some of the Bahalas, etc., Bahala rooms, etc. All right, so let's uh, let's create one of these. So we're gonna go here. Add track, instrument track. We're going to use contact here, add track, and from scratch. The process to create one of these stacked patches is going to be number one, load the tracks. Where is it here? We're going to load the tracks. So we stack patches first. Then we're going to balance. We're going to pan them if necessary. And then we're going to kill. All of this within contact because um, obviously all of this, if we open this one here, all of this, it's outputted to the same track in this case. So it's not like I can go in here uh, and apply a different EQ to a, each one of these different instruments that I would be loading here, right? So the EQ needs to happen internally. So let's go back to contact. Gonna put this up here below the piano. I'm gonna make this one pink or how many colors? This is great. This is new for me. Okay, so this is gonna be orchestra long for when we want this type of sound. And we're gonna add choir. We're gonna be able to control choir with number two. Okay, so let's build one of these. So we said that first, sorry, that first. We're going to stack the instruments. So we're going to go here. Um, and this this one in particular, I own Nucleus, the full version, but I'm going to be using the patches that are included in the light version. So we're going to, it's very simple. We're going to go here to sections, strings. Uh, no. No, 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 no. There you go. Simple as that. Nucleus of strings, full ensemble. Boom. Make this smaller. Nucleus woodwinds, full ensemble. Close. There are three tiers of creating a, a, a multi patch like this. Three tiers. Tier number one. Let's talk about this for a second. Tiers. Tier number one would be. Uh, Full orchestra recording. There are some libraries that include this already, this orchestral sound. So the result of this is uh, less control. Okay. Tier number two would be uh, full strings plus brass plus woodwinds plus okay. That, that, that's what we are doing right now. Option number three or tier number three in terms of like control is high strings, low strings, right? High strings plus low strings plus blah, 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 right? So high strings, low strings and having those patches separated and then having the high brass, low brass, etc., right? The result of this is more control, 
especially in padding because strings because um, usually high strings you can pan them a little bit more to the to the left and the low string to the right etc so this will open the sound so an example of this let me see if I can load this I'm gonna go here would be import tracks from project last movie that I did this one you need a break open ah cool uh, let me see, let me see. Long, this guy. New track, okay. And this one, it needs to be activated. This guy here. And uh, this one, uh, it's going to go to, it's gonna go to ensembles, ensembles. And this one looks like this. See that I've got high strings, low, high, low woodwinds, high, low brass, and uh, high and low um, strings kind of thing. And you can see how I can now push them a little bit more like, see, I can do this, I can do things like this. And this is gonna open the sound a little bit more. For the uh, low brass, it's a little bit more, um, it, it sits, but you can, you can separate them just a tad. Right, and you can create a little bit more of separation like this. So that would be tier number three. Same thing with our with a choir, right? If you've got high and low, you can also separate them. Even though doesn't they necess doesn't necessarily sit like this or whatever, right? So I'm just saying this is what you could do if you are if you've got a library. Tier number four. If we go crazy. Um, in the, um, right, like, okay, I'm going to load everything. For the woodwinds, I'm going to start with piccolo, flute, blah, 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 the whole thing. That would be completely overkill. Uh, because for if, if you're going to do that, you may, uh, you know, you it, it's just too much. When we, when we are doing this, this is for, these are, you know, fast action patches, sketching patches that we use for speed. And yes, we lose a little bit of the clarity by using clarity separation definition, by using this type of ensemble patches. But we are we are going for that type of orchestral ensemble sound in this case. Um, build the whole thing by, you know, by loading individual instrument patches, you know, violins one, violins two, viola, etc. That would be just too much. It would take too much also RAM and uh, it would make this very CPU intensive. And we do not want that. Okay, so at this moment, we are building it a tier two type of thing. So full strings, full brass, full woodwinds, choir patches. By the way, uh, a, a, a version B of this would be uh, to have strings, brass, woodwind, and choir. And then on top of it, stack So if you want this kind of like, uh, you know, we're not going to use names, but this kind of like more Hollywood, uh, big type of sound, right? Like um, it's just a stack. It's just, just have multiple libraries on top of another. For example, this one is, come on, you can do this. Don't crash on me. There you go. So Albion on top of uh, Symphobia. So just two libraries. So strings, woods, brass, strings, woods, brass. Right, and uh, I could stack nucleus on top of the strings, uh, but it's you know more is not always better, right? Then we're gonna start having problems of you know, frequency stacking things like this, which is why it's going why we need to balance pan and EQ to get things out of the way. So if you do things like this, like double stacking, then you're gonna have to spend some time here. Because again, more is not better, especially in the samples or sample libraries world. Um, okay, cool. Hopefully this makes sense. Going back to what we were doing, which is creating this, we were here, we are in tier two. We're doing this one. 
we are stacking the patches. So we stacked strings, woods, brass, choir. Now we have to make sure that the port is one, the MIDI. There you go. And hopefully this, no, we are not in the, here. No, it doesn't sound, why? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I don't want to waste your time for it. Just attack whatever and see this one. Let's use this one. Okay. Imagine that I'm going to get rid of this one. Did your input, uh, input does not seem to be connected with some device here. Uh, this guy here. Yeah, right. I think you need to connect it with your keyboard or something. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. No, 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 no. All MIDI input. Gracias. Thank you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, good thing about good thing about having a tablet or bad thing about having a tablet is that usually you use you create the, the foundations and then you duplicate, duplicate, duplicate because you don't want to be doing the same things over and over again. And uh, that's why I missed this one. Um, okay, cool. Awesome. So we've got this. Thanks. I'll close this one. Close this one. Oops. Well, that's okay. And then this is the... So let's just lower the... Uh, no, let's... Let's lower the volume of this one a little bit at minus 12. There you go, see. Okay, so let's balance this guy. Let's just start with zero here and let's start with the strings. So we said stack patches, balance. Let's do a quick balance. So we can start with the strings. So I put this one at minus six. Okay. Let's see, let's do middle C in kind of like at 90 position, this guy. Let's, let's make this minus ah, again. Okay, woods. Okay, so we want the woods to color the sound, but not to stand out too much. With woods, without. Okay, so that puts the strings at minus six, which is kind of like the standard for contact and minus 10 point, so minus 11 sort of thing. So five dB lower. Let's go with brass. Brass should overpower, especially if you're at 90. A little bit, not too much. Uh, in this range, right? Because we're in kind of like the middle, right? So this is middle C. So as I go here, we should hear horns and trombones. And the low trumpets that I bet in that darker range, the trumpets uh, do not have as much projection power, so they will not stand out too much. So we're going to balance here, and then we're going to just balance a little bit higher in register, okay? So that's what we're going to do. So let's bring the string. Okay. So we could we could have them a little bit lower. It depends. Uh, brass is one of these sections that it's every section in these days cinematic music, but um, but brass brass uh, the brass balance changes very very much depending on the style. Um, also in uh, 
in a, in a soundtrack mix, like the album release, the soundtrack um, mix, I've seen brass mixed very different than the actual soundtrack, like for the movie mix, because the brass will have an, an, an emotional and dramatic effect. Um, and so sometimes they're going to bring it up or lower um, in the mix if they have a stems. Um, and so, so it, the, it, it ranges a lot. So it could, this could be perfectly fine. And this is a tad hot or, or loud uh, for kind of like uh, a classical context type of thing. But for cinematic, that could be okay. We could lower it for like a 2 dBs and it would still be fine. So I lowered it 3 dBs. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit higher. So something in between. Let's see the trumpets now. So let's go lower. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go uh, choir now. Choir. Let's see. Let's mute brass just for a second. And let's balance choir just for. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this up. And then choir. Okay, plus for us. Yeah, good. I like it. And now for choir in particular, with this balance, um, what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do. Choir in particular, we're gonna go in here. We're gonna go, we're gonna select all groups. Then we're gonna go to amplifier mod. And we're gonna add a modulator that's gonna be MIDI CC. We're gonna wait a little bit because it's a big part, it seems to be. There you go. And this is gonna be number two, which is breath control, which for me is this one here. Number two is gonna control. So you're gonna you come on there. If you update it, if you update it nucleus, which I didn't, um I think you cannot do this. If that is the case. So now now I can control choir volume. Yeah, exactly, sorry. Now I'm gonna make it louder so I can control. If you cannot do that, going into tweaking these things, just you know, right click here, learn me DCC, move the one that you want, and this is gonna control. The problem with this is it's gonna mess the balance of the choir track in particular. But that, but that would be option option number two. Um, so now remove. I'm gonna bring this down here or whatever. And so now we've got everything. I can do. Awesome. Okay, so we've got balance. Panning, there's not much to do because the strings are left to right. 
woodwinds, we could move them a little bit, a little bit to the... Sorry, guys. Let's mute this guy. And let's mute this guy for a second. Yeah, let's put them here. That's it's gonna create a little bit of a space. And, and uh, just maybe the strings, just a tad, just a tad. This is gonna mess up with the low strings, but just a tad. Just for balance, because brass is gonna stay center, because we've got, I guess. I wish, solo. So as you can see, we've got horns, left, and this E flat is when the trombones come in. So here we've got a transition between horns. And trumpets. Cool. All right. So there's not much to do here because we want to preserve horns very much left and every and everyone else right. And then for choir, just choir. So in terms of, oops, in terms of balance, done, panning, done. Let's do EQ. So for EQ, give me just one second. Give me just one second. So, in terms of EQ, it's the same thing that we did here, right? Where we EQ'd every, like, things like this. We did all the EQ, instrument by instrument, remember? So, we're going to do, or, see, instrument by instrument. We're going to do the same thing internally now. So, let's do this. Internally. So, uh, we're going to go here. And we want to add a, we're going to insert, insert effects. And we're gonna EQ is a pain. We're gonna keep it very simple, two band, okay? Because basically what we wanna do is um maybe we can add a two band here, EQ, two band, max. And then we're gonna remove this one and we're gonna add a filter. And this is gonna be a high pass filter. Um something like HP2 will do. Mm, okay, so we're gonna cut at like 50 for sure. Just a little bit, but we're gonna focus here in the EQ. So this EQ, it's a pain in the butt because it's very small, it's not usable. Uh, it's usable, but it's just uh, so small. So, uh, so, so what we will do, well, is we'll try our best. So let's get started. We are here. Yep. Okay. So let's start with the strings. And what I like doing somehow sometimes is um gonna so for the strings, see that I open this is the EQ of the actual track, not of the string spot. But it allows me to um, and this is uh, from Cubase, but you can use Fab Filter or something like this, just just for visually visual reference. It's much easier to use than this one, where you cannot click and track. You can do. Let's bypass this one. You can go here and. And 
you can do the same thing. But if you want, if you are more click and drag type of thing, then you can use this one first and then copy the settings from here to here. Okay. Um, which would be, it would be something like this. Let me bring this down to minus to zero dB. So we are not queuing anything. Boom, zero. Okay. Let's do it this way, just so you see. We are trying to look for the MADI frequency. Let's, um, let's play this Reno. I like playing a cluster because if you do like a C note, there are clear, see, there are clear harmonics and it'll seem like, oh, the MADI frequency is here. It's like, no, you're just enhancing that particular harmonic. Um, and so I like to play kind of like a cluster thing. So it's easier to find where it, where it gets more MADI. I would say it's around 228. So we're gonna cut. See, see when I when I bypass, when I bypass, so when it's not active, we can hear like that low, not the low rumble, but like the mid-low rumble. See. That is just not adding to this. It's not adding in a good way to the sound. It's 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 actually subtracting because it's just adding muddiness that we don't want there. So so it's good. So minus two point seven two twenty eight minus two point seven two twenty eight. So we're gonna go here two twenty eight two twenty eight. Uh, minus two point seven. Minus two point seven. Great. And something like this. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna bypass this one. This is a little bit more aggressive. This is way more aggressive. So. Whoa. So not as much. Gonna cut maybe. So like minus two dBs kind of thing. No, minus one point seven maybe. Minus one point seven. Yeah. Saddle. Okay. And then this this one. Yeah, just a little rumble. Let me see. Let me. Yeah, there's not much. Okay, cool. So that's what we need for the strings. Let's do the same thing for um woodwinds. Now we're gonna get rid of this one and we're gonna do it directly here. And here we go. Insert effect solo. Okay, so solo insert effect. We're gonna cut a little bit. So again, same thing. Filters low pass. Um, yeah. Let's this guy here up. Filters low pass. High pass. This guy. Fifty. We can cut more, but for now. And then we're gonna add the two band just in case that we need. But for now, just gonna find that. Uh... Okay. Two oh nine. Yeah, 209. Gonna cut. Yeah. It's 
Let's make it a little bit louder so you can... Got more. Yeah. Yep, there you go. Good. Great. So now we go brass, brass. Come on, moving on. Boom, boom. Insert instruments. Uh, instrument. Uh, insert. There you go. Insert. Uh, same thing. Boom. Filter. High pass. One. This guy here at 50 for speed now. We could tweak this a little bit more with again. And then EQ, two band. I'm going to start to 50. Uh, plus start eight. Let's see. So this is brass. And we're going to solo brass. There you go. Ooh. Yeah, one one eighty. Bypass. It's just uh just afraid for like just uh, making sure that that doesn't lose the power. So maybe to minus one point two. Ah, cool this works and finally choir let's close this this guy but so far i guess let's see um mute choir yeah that's good and choir we would do the same thing okay so i'm not gonna do it just for a speed Good. This is good. This this sounds good. Okay. So step number one, with the, we've done we created that fast action patches, and this would be one of them, the the orchestra long. So this accomplished. The second one that we would have would be on sort sort of like orchestra short, like this. This one should be routed and symbols. Yep. And then we can have choir. Okay, so now we would be build the same thing, but because we are live and for interest of time, you've seen the process. I'm not. Do, I'm not gonna do it again. Okay, so. Let's go back to the slides. We've created one fast action patch, which is this one, full orchestra, long notes. I'm going to read the, the ones that I recommend you having for, again, the goal of this class is to improve our template. So our template is more agile. It's faster. Okay. Um, by the way, Rigo, don't worry about recording. I'm recording. I'll post the playback. Um, in the student area, you can watch it. We'll do it today, so don't worry. Um, so full orchestra, full orchestra long notes, full orchestra short notes. We would do the same process. These are the other sketching patches that I recommend having. And you can have whatever patches you want that you think that are going to speed up your composing speed um, or workflow. The these are the ones that I use 
these are very obvious. These are the ones that, uh, and, uh, and we'll go into some, something more in a second. But uh, these are, the, these are the, the most obvious ones and the ones that I found more useful. Obviously, so full orchestra, short notes and long notes. The same thing with the strings. Strings, long notes, strings, short notes. I'll show them in the, in the template in a second. Brass, same thing, long notes, short notes. Woodwinds, long, short notes, okay? Then having some sort of like an orchestral. Let, let me just show you here in the template. So, yeah, so we've got the strings, short notes, strings, uh, sorry, orchestra, short, orchestra, long. Strings, short notes, right? Strings, long notes. Same thing with woods and longs. short notes and long notes perk and same thing having a a a patch a percussion pad that includes all the instruments if possible uh, for this I particularly I particularly like uh, um, it's a paid one it's called, um, oh, I forgot the name. But for this one, I'm using um, Iconica, but the one that I use usually is, I forgot the name of it. But I'll, I'll post it in the chat in a second. Or Esteban will, Esteban knows. Um, so there you go. Strings, brass, woods, orchestra, Apocalypse, apoc apocalypse. Ah, yeah, there, there you go. Apocalypse. There you go. It was here. Um, I like apocalypse. It's a very old library. Uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, it has a patch. It's ensemble. It's called ensemble. I'll show it to you. Let me see if I can load this. Doom, 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 doom. Um, import tracks from project. This one. Do, 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 do. Org. Apocalypse Park. There you go. Old patch. Non up. Ah, uh, come on. Uh, spotlight. There you go. You can do this. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So Apocalypse, all library. And um, it comes with uh, everything from like like low epic percussion. To kind of like uh, epic orchestral, to kind of like uh, metal stuff. So it has a whole thing, um, and and I, I like it again. We are talking here not definition detail um, and separation. It's the complete opposite. We're talking sketching patches. So orchestral. Uh, Orchestral percussion, some sort of like a low sub bump type of instrument, piano and choir. So having these separated if possible. Okay, these are the sketching patches. Sketching patches. Now let's talk about the second. So we talked about sketching patches. Now let's move to pre orchestrated performance type of patches. These guys will allow us to. So this is like fast action. Fast action. Um, and kind of like assemble, assemble sound and sketching. These are useful for this, for the fast action, when we want the ensemble sound, right? Uh, for sketching. I'll prove this. Well, I will do this in a second uh, later on when we are composing. So this is why we use these ones. Pre-orchestrated patches is that is it just that uh, say it they, they save us the work of having to orchestrate things. And these are the ones that I recommend. Where are them? Here. So for pre-orchestrated and performance type of patches, again, these these are the ones that I use, um, and these come very handy for me. 
But this is something that evolves over time, uh, and, I and I recommend you um, creating your own, depending on the style of music that you write. I, for the type of projects that I work on, generally my music is kind of traditional orchestral type of soundtrack, uh, you know, with uh, with hybrid stuff and things like this, but uh, lots of orchestra. And so I find myself having to kind of like orchestrate, kind of like full orchestra, big, big sound type of thing. And so these are the ones that work for me. Cool. So that, uh, sorry. That being said, so with that in mind, these are the ones that I use the most, but I recommend you using the ones that work best for you based on your sound, your style, the type of music that you write, okay? So I'm going to read them and I'm going to show them. And for the interest of time, I'm going to explain how they are built, but I'm not going to build them live. So um, pre-orchestrated patches and performance type of patches for brass and the strings. For woods, I have some, but uh, I'm going to focus on brass and the strings. So for brass, I like to have a big horn sound that I don't have to create every time. And it's the one that I showed you earlier. And this is a combination here, Epic Horns. This is a combination of uh, several libraries, but essentially it's a very typical Hollywood type of orchestration. We're going to have big horns section, which is this guy here, 12 horns. Nope, this guy, sorry, 12 horns. And again, I said that I'm, you know, try, I'm trying to use free uh, or almost free libraries. This one I bought back in the day. I think it was 400 with the expansion, $800. But now it's part of Musio, which I think is a great thing. No affiliation. But now you've got Musio $9 or $10 a month. And, um, and it includes Cinebrass, which has been my, is, is been my main brass library for over a decade and um, there are many other brass libraries that I love but uh, but again trying to keep things as affordable as possible in this particular class um, so but as I was saying what you see here it's a very typical Hollywood orchestration which is um, horns big section plus one trombone horns plus one trombone which is what you see here and so I don't want to be doing this all the time and I tend to have horns and for a little bit of power and also opening the sound on the other side of the room, right? Because we've got horns on the left and then trim one trombone kind of opens the sound a little bit on the other side because they sit on opposite sides of the room. And so it's the high horns plus trombone, right? So I'm going to add it here. I'm going to mute everyone. And so I'm going to start with horns. guy here. Very typical. Now, on top of that, on top of that, I, me personally, for this particular sound, I add the solo horn on top just for definition, especially in the high register. It just adds a little bit of definition in top end. And uh, on top of that, I also added the, the horn section marcato, 
which is this guy here that I showed you earlier. That adds that oomph at the beginning of the note. Without. With. And here's where the performance patches come. The performance performance patches are those that have been recorded with the musician's performance, right? We've got short notes. That's a staccato. That's nothing, right? That's, that's just a short note. We've got long notes. There's no life. Those samples are not alive. It's just that it's 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 actually what the musicians don't do. A, a, a long sustained note is what musicians don't do when they are playing real music. Right? And so we are using samples that are static, you know, non-alive recordings of music, and we're trying to make them feel alive by using these guys right, and all these things. But that's, that's not what the musicians do. Musicians perform music, right? Perform performance. And when they perform, they actually sing, right? It's, uh, and so even if they have like a 20-second sustained note, Right, there is still some aliveness, right? That it's not if it says if it says mezzo piano, they still modulate up and down depending on what's going on musically, right? If a melody, if there's a long note in in violas, for example, and there's a big strings melody, maybe they'll bring it a little bit quieter with less vibrato, right? And then at the moment where the melody ends, then maybe it's the end of that long note. They'll increase the volume of that note, they'll add a little bit more vibrato. The typical things that are alive band or a live orchestra will do by listening to each other right those are the things that make the music sound alive and so by using performance type of patches crescendo to crescendos for chatos things like this right it you will make your music sound alive that is why um sometimes it's much effective using a tremolo uh, a, a, like the tremolo instead of using sustained strings using tremolo strings because just the fact of them doing the tremolo is going to feel a little bit more performed a little bit more alive with samples right I'm not saying that tremolo is better than sustained but with samples tremolo is more prefer it's more alive than sustained and sometimes when using samples and if you're not going to replace it with an orchestra sometimes consider tremolo instead of sustained because um uh, it just every, anything that you can use in your template that has been performed, it's going to it's going to capture and and use the magic of that trained musician, the magic that that trained musician put into recording that sample, right? And uh, I want to make use of that because they are definitely think about the sample libraries. You know who rec like where do they get recorded and who records who are the musicians generally it's like top notch it's like the best musicians in the world in the best rooms in the world right so by being by recording them in the best rooms in the world we're capturing the room sound but making use of the musicians performance who's you know been trained like, been playing that instrument for over two or three or four decades right i want to capture that magic that they are able to like everyone can grab a violin and record a you know a sustained note anyone doesn't make it, but I want to capture their the, the magic that they imprint into those notes by using performance. And the live rays will have, yeah, sustained staccatos and things like this, but also will have crescendos and the crescendos, and we've got this for chatos, so we'll have things like this, right? So we want to use this. Um, and this, so it's a combination. Well, when we are building a patch like this, and I put the hand on the keyboard, it's like, oh my gosh, this sounds so good, right? Well. It is some work behind this, right? This does, does two things. Uh, it'll press the director. I'm just kidding. No, it'll uh, basically one thing. It'll allow you to to uh, to go to work faster, to compose faster. When I need this sound, not always I need this sound. It's a big horn sound. But if I need that kind of like a big Hollywood type of sound, then I have it built there. Cool, awesome. So, epic horns, epic trumpets. Same thing, but with trumpets. And by the way, the last thing that I did here is add in the epic horns, it's add in an ensemble horns or ensemble brass, uh, ensemble high brass type of pads that I filtered the trumpets a little bit just for extra. I wanted something big and epic. Same thing with trumpets. 
right? So again, a, a, a build patch where I combine, in this case, a little bit of a forchato trumpet and a legato trumpet section and the legato solo trumpet. So not much here. Let's continue. Um, ensemble string sustain and low string sustain. So sometimes when you want uh, this kind of typical like uh, classical, uh, you know, Th Thomas Newman strings type of sound, it's like a softer um, type of uh, strings. Let me see if I have them somewhere here. Hold on here. There you go. Like regular strings would be like this. But sometimes you want it. This is a softer sound. Well, having a patch that's built so we can soften the strings quickly. This is just a filter. I think I built it with, there you go, yeah. Yeah, this guy here, see? This filter here. So it just right click, assign. This in particular is Halion from Speed, from uh, Speedfire, uh, from Steinberg. Um, everything is Speedfire. They are, they are everywhere. I'm just kidding. Um, from Steinberg. And, um, and it just uh, I automated the, the the high frequency filter. And um, yeah, but you can do the same thing with contact. So these are high strings where I've got control over the high uh, or the low pass. Um, and then having another one with just low string sustained uh, consortina, I recommend if you can. So a string going back to ensemble strings with sustain with the EQ for warmth and being able to control this and low string sustain. If you can also string sustain sortino, this comes very handy uh, sometimes. Strings tremolo or if you can uh, uh, something that transition from sus to tremolo like this. So sustain. So this thing, this this will come handy. Uh, I also recommend violins one and two section legato. So this guy, this guy. So this is one and two. See one and two here. Mix. Right, and then having the same thing but in octaves. Here. Hello. See? This one is in octaves. In this, in this particular case, it's just a, it's a patch called Soaring Strings that has violins one and two in octaves. And then the cellos and double bases in octaves as well. This is gonna be yeah, again. You can you can copy paste orchestrate this, but when you want this quick faster sound, it's good to have them like this. Um, so in octaves, and then high, the same thing staccatos, staccatos in octaves, and low string staccatos. I like to have the low string staccatos. Um, for the lower string staccatos, it's always tricky because it always gets muddy. So I like to set up the strings. Um, and again, this is the, the one that I built with with Iconica because now uh, with Cubase, there's a, even Cubase artist, the Iconica, Iconica sketch is free and most of the patches that I use here are included there. Some not, but most of them do. The Celli standard doesn't, but this is built in a way, and by the way, I link, I'll include videos, I'll include links below this video where you can see me uh, actually building these patches, but I don't want to make this class super long. I just want to show the, 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 the kind of like the evidence, not the evidence, but the, 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 
we're going to compose some music later on and you'll see how the combination of all these patches allow you to compose music super, super fast. Um, so anyway, going back to low string staccatos, I like to have a little bit of um, added definition to the lower strings. And so low strings sound like this. which sound low and muddy. And when we do kind of like cinematic music and we start, you know, doing like power chords down here. It's very typical because nowadays orchestral music is composed with, you know, with a keyboard and a sequencer. And there are many composers that come from like the rock, heavy metal world. And these, or the, you know, more like electronic. And these, these not how, you know, Mendelssohn used to write for strings, but these days it, it is, right? Because of um, influence of other styles. And, and this is what makes cinematic music sound like cinematic music sometimes. But then it also brings some problems. The reason why Men Mendelssohn wouldn't do things like this because it sounds muddy, um, especially if Mendelssohn was using samples where we have on top of the problem of having, you know, a low register instrument playing some somehow a closed, um, a closed voicing in the low register, which is a no-no in orchestration. But on top of that, we've got the problem of that we are using sample libraries, and so we are stacking more than usual because this is not, this is, we're stacking everything here. This is a section of whatever, like low strings, maybe we've got cellos and double basses here. So maybe a group of like 16 or 18 people. And then when we do two notes, it's not the busy now. Now we've got another, you know, 18 people, we've got 36 people here, right? Uh, so it's too, it's, it's a problem. On top of that, it's the same room that we're stacking, the same set of mics, it's the same preamp, the same everything, right? That's, we start having that frequency stacking, muddiness, blah, 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 the whole thing. Um, so for strings, I like to add, for low strings, because we're going to be doing things like this. We're going to be doing things like this. I want to have a little bit of extra added definition. And generally, typically, what you see being done, uh, and, and even in our casual recording setting, is it gonna record, if, if things like this need to be um, uh, featured, um, then you're gonna record the low strings, and then you're gonna record a pass of closed mic cellos, closed mic cellos. Um, and that that's gonna, it just uh, add a little bit of brightness to this, for example. See? Without. So. Let's go here, mix, so you can see. So. See, and this adds a little bit. Let's. So it's kind of like, I like to use a kind of like a spiccato, which is the kind of like the shortest articulation. It's usually a little bit brighter as well um, because of the, the way it's bowed. Um, and uh, close miking. If we go to edit uh, and we go to cello and we go to, I forgot how to use this guy. Mics, where are the mic position? Forgot. Na, 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 na. I forgot. That's okay. But close mic. And that's the finishing. You get the point. And then finally. This guy. So. So I kind of like kind of strings ensemble, closer sound, the strings ensemble, kind of like farther away sound for room, but a little bit lower in volume. And then uh, in higher in volume, kind of like speak out the cellos with closed mics for this. Kind of like more definition than if we just had for the lower strings. So that's what I like to build for the strings, for the lower strings. And you'll see all of this put in action and I'll see how it makes sense. High strings, uh, staccatos and high strings, uh, in octaves. I don't know where I have the, the ones in octaves. I don't have them here, but it's okay. Cool. 
All right, so that's it for that's that's it for the pre-orchestrated and performance type of budget. I've got more, but these would be the most important ones. I've got some for woods as well, but obviously things like scales, runs, um, you know, atonal ribs and things like this. Atonal ribs for for woods are very useful. Uh, a you know, scales and runs and things like this for, for strings are very useful. Any, anything that captures performance is going to be useful. Okay. But this would be the, bur the, the, the basic ones. Okay. So we talked about the sketching patches. We've talked about the pre orchestrated patches. Let's compose some music. Let's, uh, let's see if uh, this is true. So, yeah, let's see. It's a little bit low. Minus twenty four. Minus twenty two. And uh, test test. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. Um, so let's start with those uh, sustained strings with warm. Why is it so low in volume? It is low, isn't it? Stereo out. Uh, one sec. Um, this, let me think. Yeah, I think so. Let's see. Let's compose something like a like an opening, a logo opening, something like this. Uh, okay. Yeah. One, two, three, four. I'll just do two. One, two. Something like this. Now we're gonna copy this from this to this to the lower strings. We're gonna to we're gonna preserve the MIDI data, and we're gonna remove all this, and we're just gonna write the low notes, the low notes, which are going to be what's going on. Oh, I see what's going on. Uh, no, what's going on? Let me just do this. J. Boom, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why are these guys so low in volume? Uh, what did they do? What did they do here? Maybe this, that's why. Let's see. One sec. Oh, here's where the mics were. Mics were here. Okay, forgot. Okay. Anyway, going about mix, mix, oh, zero, that's why. Messed up something here. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, now I have to bring this up to minus 17. Let's see. Now it's just too low. That's a little, let me just readjust everything. Test, test, okay. Okay, cool. Um, yes, b uh, balance, volume on your end. Yes, okay, cool. So, again, we're going to copy and paste the high strings to the lower strings. We're just going to record the, the low notes. And... Cool. So the whole strings thing done. Okay, cool. This guy could do the start a little bit earlier here. Get out. Boom. 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 Yes, 
that's cool. We're gonna add a little bit of that thing that we built earlier. Here at the end, for emphasis. I thought too late. Yes, exactly. It's a little too low in volume. Let's bring it up. Minus three. Yes, good. And um, let's see. Horns, let's do, if there's an opening, we need some horns. Epic horns. Um, um, let's see what we can do here. Tum, tum. Now. Yeah, something like this. Do -do -do -da -da. You know what, we can add a little bit of those tremolo strings at the end, uh, maybe like... Yeah. I always end a little bit too early. That's okay. I'm more of it. What else? Maybe a uh, piatti. No, let's go with the trumpet. The end. Yeah. No, 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 no. Long of a tail, cool. But, um, maybe have a, a little bit of um, now that I have it here, Celesta. Then, where's the trumpet? I lost trumpet, trumpet here. Mm. Yep. Out. Just uh, too soft. This is yeah. Maybe a little bit of the timpani. Tim 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 timpani. No. Uh, One, two. Look at them. Let me record you. Let me see. Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, soft. Soft mallet. So this is the Tukutan. This one has to be here. One. There you go. Um, so and then and then we're gonna oops and then we're gonna key switch here to this one is going to be this guy. So key switch to the yeah. 
so this is actually yeah 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 expression we're gonna bring it here yeah so Harp, you know, this guy, um, maybe. It's not perfect, but uh... there you go. Send to client, and if it gets approved, twenty minutes of work. All right, that's it. That can I want it to be? Can I proof? We all, you know, all assembled, all you know, pre-orchestrated sketching and sample type of patches obviously we lose a little bit of definition but we were going for this kind of like bigger sound and uh that is it yeah that's it that's the end of this today's class we're gonna open for q and a and um what we have done today is work on this on the speed layer which is today january 10th the next class is going to be uh with yeah with uh with all the templates finished at this point, next, which is this, this guy here, next week we're gonna compose and kind of like positive emotions cue, a love cue, and then next week after we're gonna compose a tension cue, then the week after we're gonna adapt the template for frameless scoring, and we're gonna score on a scene. So that's the next two classes. So they should be a little bit shorter than this one that went a little bit longer. Um, Q, Q and A questions. I see ninety comments in the chat that I didn't read. I am so sorry, um, Stefan. Uh, or if if you if you have the question, yes. just feel free to unmute and let's go. Okay, I I see the first one is by <clears throat> sorry, it's about reverbs. But uh, it's sorry, I miss it. Okay. A quick question. Are you using the Nucleus driver or do you have it disabled? Ivan Salat asks. Great question. Hey, Patricia, thanks for joining. Uh, no, I the, so Nucleus completely disabled or should be disabled. Um, maybe I did it very, very quickly for this particular patch that we built together, but one second. There you go. Nope. There you go. Cool. But uh, generally, I'll have it disabled, or is it? Perfect. Peter asks, why is Mark using, using, using insert on contact rather than on his DOM mixer channels? No, just for the, just for the um, uh, sketching patches where I have a, a series of stacked patches and I have to control uh, you know, frequency stacking within contact. Um, on top of that, I will do it again here. Sorry, not here. Here in the domain channel. The only reason why I was doing it in contact, see here, up here. The only reason why I was doing it in contact is because it is a multi patch um, instrument. And so I need to take care of frequency stacking problems within contact first because I'm stacking instruments in there. That's why. Cool. More questions? Okay. <clears throat> I continue reading. Uh, Jesse Carmichael asks, 
Also curious about how much more CPU intensive it is to use individual instrument tracks for each articulation rather than using expression map for each instrument. That way it's easier to transfer the one MIDI track into a notation software rather than having to match multiple articulation MIDI regions. Yes. So it's a it's a matter of preference. Uh, so basically, it's a question in regards of key switches or or individual uh, individual. Uh, articulation separated by tracks. Um, I, I do a combination of both. Sometimes it's useful to be, and again, and this is this is not my main template. In this case, for example, the template that we loaded from BBC, and then we tweaked, they separated things by articulation. You can see here in the strings, for example, violin one, long, short, pizzicato, tremolo. Um, I generally work with key switches generally, but I also like to have some libraries spread into the having different articulations, different tracks, pros and cons. Key switches, yes, easy to transfer, you know, export to, easy to transfer from, from DO to SCORE, which I personally don't care because I always have someone else doing this for me. So that's the first thing. Um, also, pros is a little bit more organized. Um, your template is not as big, etc. So that is good. Um, and again, most of most, I would say 60, 70 percent of my template is key switches. On the other hand, having different different articulations separated would allow you to do stacking. Sometimes you may have a uh, legato pad that you want to add a little bit of an spiccato or a sforzato note underneath just to add a little bit of oomph at the beginning of each transition or each note, things like this. Uh, by having them separated, you'll have this con control. So pros and cons, um, you know, to me, at the end of the day, it's a combination of both. Um, so it's, you know, personal preference. But yeah, the, definitely the exporting to score um, when using key switches much, much easier and faster and streamlined. Okay, uh, another one. Craig asked, what was the Harp library? Oh, the Harp library, I think it was BBC. I mean, the free, let me see, did we use? Yes, this was BBC free. Discover. Yeah, discover. Since you can see, like if I, if I, I've got another ARP here loaded, which is this one here. Look at the difference. Obviously, mic position, we can tweak all this, but out of the box, the orchestral tools or iconic in this case, it's way closer than the Spitfire. Generally, it always starts very, very wet. Uh, harp. This uh, speed fire. But obviously we can tweak. Well, not in the free one, uh, but uh, but mics and all that you can get a little bit closer sound, whatever. Cool. Yep. There you go. I have a question. I don't know how to ask for a question. Can I just yeah. burst in like this? Okay. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah. So um, this is Shira, and I've hey, written Shira. a number of string quartets, and all my recordings have been, you know, me saving my money and paying for people in the studio to play for me. And now I'm trying to pay uh, to do symphonies, and it's expensive, but what the guy in the studio said is, put your stuff in Pro Tools, we'll, we'll hire five, you know, horns, woodwinds, and five strings, that way it only doubles your cost, and we'll fold it back in. So I've spent the past two years learning how to do Pro Tools and killing myself, but I'm good at it now enough. But here's the thing, if I start cheating and using these strings libraries, and I'm sorry, I used the word cheating, and these brass libraries, man, do I get a pretty cool sound. But on okay. strings, because I'm a string player, I always get better orchestration if I break it out and do each of the part myself. But on brass, I'm shitty at it. It's better for me to play it on the piano, give it to a brass section on my synthesizer, and it sounds cool. And when I try to give it to the instruments, I, I feel stupid. I don't even know what instruments to give it to very well yet. And when you do all this group stuff, eventually, right, you have to break it out in order to give it to real players. Does that make sense? Am I making Abs sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Brass voicing, like, it's, it's, it can be very tricky with the strings. It. I'm, I'm going to say something, but it's... it's every... <sighs> Everything like if if you can play it in the piano, the strings can make it work in a way. The strings always sounds good. It is, uh, but with with brass, um, the voice you have to voice it correctly. Otherwise, it's not gonna sound like you. You know, or the voicing is gonna change the brass sound very very much. 
And it can sound jazzy when you want it to sound cinematic or casual, right? Uh, just by, you know, where, where, you know, how you voice it and where the voice, like how, you know, high or low the voicing is placed, things like this. I can ask that question if I can jump in for a second. Go ahead. For brass voice. So any wind instrument, you need to remember wind instruments need to breathe. And you figure professionals have a better lung capacity than most us, most of us mortals. But being a classically a classical upright bass player in an orchestra, um, you have to remember that there's always breathing involved. So when you're writing any kind of brass, woodwind, flute, any wind instrument, one, you need to remember there are breath points. Two, when it comes to the voicings, it all depends on the type of brass you're going to be using. I made a comment in the chat that um, if you're just recording for horns, you know, what kind of horns? Um, remember, you have to actually know the instrument that you're writing for. So if you're writing for orchestral, you know, you have to look at, you know, what does the LA Phil, what does the London Phil have complement wise? Look up the players and look up their instruments. They're listed because every horn, every trumpet is different. Um, of writing for a flugelhorn is different than writing for a trumpet um, versus writing for a euphonium, which is, you know, the great secret sauce of any orchestra. So I hope that helps you. I have a question when you're done with your question because I've been raising my hand for the last 10 minutes, but no one's noticing. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to you. Shira, what I would recommend is go to the orchestration. If you are in the in the cinematic composing membership um, or you got any of our packages, you may have access to the orchestration uh, program and go to the brass section um, and kind of like, yeah, dive into the specifics of each one of the instruments in the in the brass section i think that's going to start answering some of your questions start answering any orchestration course or book starts answering your questions but the best thing that as you just mentioned um is speaking with the with the musicians it's like what's what's wrong here and uh, using like sample libraries are very very different than live musicians um and uh, depending on what you're writing there are sample libraries for you know epic cinematic brass there are libraries for jazz brass there are libraries for so um um so this is very very specific and what by the way what you, you were just mentioning um talking about you started writing for quartets now you want to write for a more symphonic sound and uh something for you to consider as you were talking i was thinking about this just wanted to mention to you something for you to consider is a sweetening a sweetening session uh so a combination of live musicians with samples when you want the bigger sound the samples provide the bigger sound the orchestra provides the you know the the, the aliveness of the music and uh, you ask you would ask the musicians to perform as if they were performing in a section not as a quartet but as in a section right and so you then blend for this to happen you would have to do the mock-up first and when they are recording they need to use head headphones and listen to your mock-up so they tune to your samples uh, otherwise it's a waste, waste of time because it, that they would be out of tune so that's something for you to consider maybe thank you and sorry uh i took a question out of line i don't know how to use the zoom very well i apologize <laughs> no worries that's okay that's okay there's a section there's a section under um the emotions where it says raise hand lower hand um, Mark, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I noticed being being an upright bass player, um, I noticed the sound that you're using for the strings and our friend here, the cellist, can attest. I noticed that when you're going for that deep, heavy sound, there's a technique with the bow where you actually are starting to perform at the frog, right where your hand is. And it gives you the most powerful sound when you start playing. And it gives you that rum, rum kind of sound that, you're, that your samples were using. But I have found that um, typically, at least for all the classical greats, they only use those for a couple of notes, and then they tell you know they they instruct the musicians through sheet music to use usually the mid section of the bow, which gives you that warmer, tastier feeling and that grit that you're talking about. You know, it's used, but it's used sparingly. And I noticed that in your particular sample, and and the way your mock-up is set up, that is your sound. And I was just wondering, has anyone ever said anything to you about? You know that's too much. I love when I, I compose. Go, go, go ahead. Sorry, did they want no, to interrupt I, you? I, 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 no, I'm sorry. I mean, you're you're a known composer. I'm an unknown composer, but I've done stuff for the micro, uh, the the micro sync licensing world of Twitch and YouTube, and I've done a couple of scores. And whenever I score music, I remember what the 150 piece orchestra sounded like. And by being, you know, 
a principal bassist in an orchestra, you know, we're responsible for um, how the basses sound, especially because we're the heaviest sound of an orchestra when you have eight basses playing in unison. So I was just curious about the choice of your string sound, because I know you're doing a grouping and I know this is all meant to be free or close to free and stuff, but that one particular sound, you're using it, you, you, it's like using jalapenos when all, all the recipe calls for is salt and pepper. And I was just kind of curious about your input on that. A hundred percent. That's uh, I love everything that you say. And that's the, when you speak with, uh, uh, I, I was, I had a conversation with an orchestrator the other day, uh, very well known. And, uh, it's like he orchestrates for your real orchestra, but, uh, he was doing a mock-up and he doesn't know, you know, a lot about Cubase, but he knows about the instrument, just like what you are discussing. And uh, when you want to emulate a realistic orchestral sound, it's super important to to know, to understand, to get to know the, the actual... If you are trying to recreate the orchestral sound, the traditional orchestral sound, everything that you're saying is very, very important. And uh, the, the problem with uh, sample libraries is that it's a simplification of the real thing. Uh, the cool thing is that there are many sample libraries and uh, there are different types of articulations that can be accessed in different types of libraries. Not every library has everything. So, for example, yes, for strings, I I personally, when I, when I write, I... Um, the, 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 this, this, usually, it's, it's said that uh, timbrically, the brass has a you know much bigger range than the strings. I... I do not completely agree. It's, it's more obvious that this it's a timbrical change in brass from pianos to fortes and things like this. But the strings texturally they have so many nuances. It's just less noticeable, but they are there. So I agree with everything that you are saying. And so in my music, when I've got the time and I'm using the full template, I do have all this access to different type of articulation sounds. So for example, generally my strings sustain like if we're like my violins one sound for example usually i include in that patch you know you know from you know from sul tasto to very soft sustain to regular sustain with the five dynamic layers so i can transition from this type of soft because most of the string library starts with kind of like what it's like like a regular mezzo piano but there's so much more below that mezzo so yes i agree 100 percent yeah this is a, it's a simplified version a starting point of what a template would be but what everything that you're mentioning is what makes it actually sound good it's not as much the mixing and mastering i did sort of the, the mixing and the cueing and this all that is important because that eliminates problems but it's the understanding how an instrument actually works that makes the biggest difference when you're creating an orchestral mock-up and if that orchestral mock-up is the final product if you're going to replace with a with a with a real orchestra and you have an, an orchestrator that you trust they know what to do you, you, you'll write the notes like full orchestra or whatever, very soft here, whatever, and you won't care about, you know, what you're doing with the samples because you just need the speed. But for example, for the last three projects that I did, kind of like TV movie in the ultra low budget and the 30 days, yes, everything is in the box. There's no recording, there's no mix. And so, yes, we have to be, I have to be very, you know, very careful with what I'm doing if I, because the mock-up is the final sound. And so all these nuances, I do, I do pay attention to. All my stuff is in the box, as you say. I, I use my, my my backbone for my strings. I, I saved up for it was Abbey Road's one because, and I have the entire library. Um, wow. And, and and use you know I have I have the Armageddon, which I'm sorry, Apocalypse, which is a great version as well. Um, so I have a lot of things. You probably we probably have similar products. Um, but just one note to everybody. Um, I'm going to just quickly share something that I learned. Back in 1989, um, Leland R. Kiefer used to be the A and R man for the record plant here in Hollywood. I'm in LA, by the way, and um, he made me uh, made me understand something. He says, "Look, virtual instruments are coming." He, he saw it way in advance before it was really a thing, and it's simple: learn to play "Amazing Grace" on every instrument you want to write for. It's a simple little tune; everyone knows it. And when it comes to brass, the simplest instructions I was taught was sing the part as if you want the player to play it and then try to translate that into whatever virtual instrument you're using. Um, even if you're using free stuff or stock stuff, um, the truth is you just want to be able to sing it and then perform it. And always remember that 
instruments need to breathe. And even with trumpets or brass, there's a moment where they need a they need a moment besides breathing, but to to activate their spit valve to get the condensation out of their instruments. So when you're trying to compose something, even in the box, and you want to make it sound as real as possible, always remember, as as, as Mark mentioned, knowing the instrument, all brass instruments need to spit. All flutes, a little different, but any kind of big brass, you know, there's, there's a moment where they're breathing. And if you're like, I saw one person on, on the chat, he's wearing Sennheiser HD 650s or 600s. Um, you need really good cans to listen to that are perfectly flat, plus one, negative one dB, and listen to really good orchestras. You will hear the blowing, and they actually time the blowing for different places in the music, so they're not just blowing randomly. So even those little nuances can make or break what a real recording is. And even like if you have sound iron products, they give you those those different breath applications. And like, what is this for? And that's what it's for. So you want to try to incorporate that into your music. I'm off my soapbox. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for uh, for the input. Hey, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Mark, this is Tom. Hi. Hey, Tom. How are you? Okay, man. I have just two simple questions. Number one, I notice you don't use Contact 7. Is there a reason for that? At the moment with my setup, it's very uh, CPU intensive. And so I do have oh, it installed, okay. but at, uh, it's just, uh, no, it's good. It's good. I have it there. But uh, there are some libraries where it's not, uh, for example, with... Uh, with the last version of Cine Strings, Cine Strings 2.0 in uh, Contact 7, it is just mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. problems. But anyway, I have it yeah. there. I'm just incorporating little by little. Okay. And the my other question is, can you just give me a quick view or maybe point me somewhere to explain EQ frequency stacking? I'm not quite sure I understand what that is. That's a great question. So let me see if we can use frequency star in EQ. Let's let's look for a graphic somewhere. Images. I think the e the best graphic to illustrate what I'm trying to explain would be meh, this one for example. So Usually this this happens this happens more in the mid low range. But let's say that we have a series of instruments, and this is this each one of the color is a different instrument, right? And so there is a place in the frequency spectrum where uh, they they tend to resonate more, and because we are stacking instrument after instrument after instrument, that's what, that's what we do with samples, then we have this frequency stacking problem. This all, the, the, the problem with this, uh, with samples, is that generally when you hear a live orchestra, it's the one instrument, it's that one big instrument, that orchestra performing live in a room. And if you're in a concert hall, that room is designed, so you sitting in row 20, maybe right, like maybe like 20 meters away, from the orchestra, or whatever, um, you get the best possible sound because the way it's been designed, the absorptions, the reflections, etc. Right? Uh, scoring a stage is like a concert hall, but it's more controlled, so less reverb, a shorter reverb tail, and it's more controlled. It's like in a studio for an orchestra, right? So if you are recording an orchestra there and you've got your mics, it's good. That's how the orchestra sounds, and that, that's the sound. With sample libraries. It usually is a scoring stage with the same mic array that you would use to record an entire orchestra. But now you are even like even if the group is sitting to the left, you also are gonna have the the the, the right mics, etc. The only thing that you will not have are all the spot mics for other sections, but you will still have the deca tree and the whites and the surrounds, etc. Um, the outringers, and so that set of mics just for violins one section. Right, with the same room and the same preamps and the same everything, the same processing. So when you are now adding violins one, when you are a violins two and violas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and sorry if I'm pointing the right way, I think it's flipped. But violins one, two, violas, etc. And then you know woods and brass, everything. It's basically it's the same set of mics again, the same room, and you're starting and the the the, the mics generate a, uh it's not a flat response of that you know that set of mics and room and so there are certain frequencies that tend to you know stack 
and the main biggest problem generally is in the mid low end between 200 to 400 cycles there's another one at around 2k the rotation frequency kind of thing and so it's it's because we have this stacking problem when using sample libraries that we are literally stacking instruments, which is not how an orchestra actually performs. It's one big massive instrument performing at the same time. There is no stacking whatsoever. And the orchestra has been designed and evolved over the years and centuries um, to the way it is right now for it to blend perfectly together. When If you have all the orchestra performing unison C in its mid-range for each one of the instruments, uh, in Mezzo Forte, it's going to sound balanced and well. Um, but for us, we're going to have these frequencies stacking. Does this make sense, Tom? I don't want to over explain this. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. And that was the EQing of kind of carving out some of these 200 to 400 or 2K to 3K, correct? That's exactly what I was doing. And it's a small, uh, and it's a small little nuance that doesn't make that big of a difference when for one instrument, but for all together, it, it, is, it is very meaningful. Gotcha. Thank you so much. It's a great question. Uh, so to avoid to, to avoid muddiness, generally the big things are going to be after balance, obviously, because we can generate muddiness with wrong balance, right? Um, but generally it's going to be panning first because just panning it creates so much space. EQ second, and then a good uh, a good use of reverbs as well. Yep. Um, so we're gonna catch up the low frequencies for the reverbs and things like this. One one thing I want to chime in that I think you forgot to mention, which is important, which you do in the mock-up stage. It's called sound stage placement. Um, I sent the link in the chat. I explained this in detail for those that actually want to know what it is. But when you're when you're writing orchestral music, remember um, you need to pan the instruments to the actual location on the stage, typically where the orchestra is placed. Um, Esteban showed the. BBC Orchestra Free, and they actually give you one particular layout, which is the British style. Um, just again, LA Phil versus um, London Phil. They place the instruments a little differently, depending, or even go to the Hollywood Bowl if you're in LA and see how they set their orchestras up. But the sound placement is done by panning. And then also for those that want to get the sound where the horns are further in the back or the percussionists are further in the back, you actually control it by volume. There's a great tool out there called um, Pan Management, which I have in that link on that Discord page I, I provided. It's a free tool that also offers a paid version for a little more oomph to what the product does. But what's great about it is, is that there's a pin that does all the work for you. And you literally just drop the pin where you want and you can hear it in your headphones where in the sound stage placement that goes. Um, if you are any vinyl lovers in here, pick up any record, any classical record that is mastered from the mastering lab, and you will hear the utmost perfectness of soundstage placement. But besides EQ, where you place your instruments on your audible soundstage is equally as important to it. You just don't want to record things with your pan knob at 12 o'clock. That's it. There's, um, yeah, thank you. The... That's really good. The, the the only addition to this that I would say um, is depending on the libraries that you use, that placement. So the reason why I was panning, generally in the past I didn't recommend you, to, like you don't need to pan because those libraries, the, the library, the violins one section has already been recorded in the right spot in the sound stage. Um left right and also front to back right and when they record horns they are placed farther away than the violins one in the same side uh depending on the, the libraries but most of them is going to be left and farther away from the deca tree outringers and and the surrounds they'll still have the spot mics but they because they captured your room they are also capturing the position of the instrument most of the libraries that i use and most of the libraries that I'll get to that in a second, most of the libraries that I use are wet type of libraries. Libraries that have been recorded this way with the decatry. There are other libraries that are dry. They are recorded in a smaller space with closed mics, etc. And then you have to recreate that, that room and position the instruments in the right place, not just left to right, but also depth. I generally I add I, I add I control depth a little bit because I add 
and on top of the wet sound, I add extra reverb, a little bit of algorithmic, a little bit of uh, convolution algorithmic reverb. But it's not my main focus because depth has already been created by the way they got recorded. And so understanding how they got recorded, those horns that I was playing, they already sound farther away than the strings. Right? Um, so that is something to keep in mind as well. I, in the past, I used to say, don't need to pan the instruments or don't need to position front back the instruments because they already been recorded in the right position. Though, so no need to do that until a point where I got, where I saw my music mixed for the first time. And, um, and it was a mock-up with orchestra. And I was seeing that the Dennis Sands was the mixing engineer was actually panning a little bit my, my mock-up sounds my sample library sounds. And I was like, why do you do that? Like the strings already sound to the left. Like like you can hear them to the left. They, they got recorded. Did you record these strings? I was like, because it was a, a Cine strings. And then he recorded these strings for Cine samples. It's like, yes, yes, a hundred percent. But again, for cinematic or casual music, and because we stack so many things, I'm going to take these strings that already, or these violins that already sound to the left, and I'm going to, I'm going to close them, I'm going to narrow them a little bit. They are still going to, so, so I'm, they already sound to the left. I'm going to close them a little bit. They still sound to the left. And now I'm going to position them a little more to the left. That way I carve out some of the sound by using panning, um, while still preserving the room, because when I'm doing this, I'm also closing the ambient of the room. But on top of that, I'm going to add a reverb that's going to put them all together. So it's like, oh, makes complete sense. So if you're gaining a little bit of a space and then uh, but you're reducing the, the, the room a little bit as well, which I thought it would be artificial, but you are doing it. So you are doing it and you've got the credentials. You can do this or you can do this. OK, I, I, I buy it. And then on top of that, you're going to add the reverb to put everything together because you're actually mixing different libraries plus a recording of a live orchestra. And this is the way to put it all together. OK, cool. Awesome. So um, that's the only addition to what you have said is like, yes, depth is very important, but but, that, but depth has al already been created by the way it has been recorded. So re to, to take just respect, to respect that. And if you want to get them a little bit closer or farther away, I start um, by using different mic positions that are available in the library and then a touch of, of uh, reverb on top of that if I need to position them farther away. Cool. More questions, more comments. Fabian, dale. ¿Qué pasa? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, how are you? <laughs> yeah, bien. Mark, just a basic question. Uh, I'm studying in this. and uh, do, Can you possibly recommend uh, some string libraries that are not that expensive? <laughs> okay. But, uh, yes. Um, so, uh, I would say... My okay, my that are not that expensive. I would say the most the 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 most cost effective string sample library at the moment, even though it's not my favorite one, but I've been using it for years. And just uh, the past two years, I've been using Cinematic Studio strings. But before that, I used a lot a combination of a Spitfire and Cine strings. So Cine strings is always a love hate. There's some people who love them, some people who I, I use some of it. There's a, the only problem with uh, Cine strings in my opinion, they sound beautiful. They sound a little bit brighter than other sample libraries because the way they got recorded and, and that then it sounds using the vintage M50s with that, uh, with that capsule that creates a little bit of a brighter sound. Sometimes a little bit of, out of tune, sometimes. That's a problem, but but it's just, just so so small, and sometimes you will find that when you are stacking articulations, you can find some out of tuneness. For example, if you are stacking a you know uh, a you know like a longest the, the longest for chatter recording they've got on top of the long notes, sometimes some notes are a little bit out of tune. But for nine or ten sorry ten dollars a month in Musio. Um, maybe that's see, like for any composer who are starting out who want to use professional sample libraries at an affordable price, I would recommend Musio, Musio, and not the Native Instruments complete, um, uh, complete or the East West subscription things like this. They they are good, but I my opinion, 
Musio is more catered to the kind of like the cinematic kind of sound. So I would start with this. Maybe option number one. Option number two could be um, BBC, uh, the middle version that includes all the orchestra. I still like kind of like the the, the samplers like Contact or Musio that allow you to stack patches. So that's that's what I would recommend. Um, in this template, for this template, I use BBC Free Discovery. Um, it's a little bit, it's good, but it's a little bit limited. It has no layers, no no dynamic layers. M mm. Musio, I do you? Does this help you, Fabian? Yeah, a lot, a lot. Yeah. And sorry it, for the basic you, question. <laughs> no, you, you you guys, everyone in the chat, if you maybe you've already done, uh, but feel free to to post some uh, recommendations. Uh, these are the, the ones that I would the, the the one that I use the most at the moment. The Cinematic Studio Strings is four hundred dollars, and then when you've bought one of their libraries, the next one is uh, they have a, a kind of like a, sorry um, a discount if you are a client that you can get the next one for two hundred. So if you were to buy brass, the later on is two hundred. What do you consider okay, thanks for, a lot, Mark? Yeah, Fabian. Mark, Mark, um, yeah. let's assume that you can afford the products. What products would you buy? Aside from BBC Abbey Roads One, I mean, is that Albion worth it? I, to me at the moment, I am using the more, um, Cinematic Studio String, Cinematic Studio Woods, and Cinematic Studio Brass recently. I just acquired, but for yeah, uh, Cinematic Studio Strings is just yeah. The more I use it, the more I see. It's just so simple, right? But then you, you start discovering like the, the sound is beautiful, but then usability is great. Um, the legatos are beautiful. Um, the when you're writing more like classical nuanced music, they are capable of doing it. Um, it that doesn't have everything, but it has a lot. Uh, so it doesn't have soldastos. It doesn't have things like this. But to me, a combination of uh, like cinematic studio strings for legatos is just is just amazing. Um, and then maybe, you know, all the things like every library has its own taste. I, you know, the Abbey Road one uh, strings are beautiful. Uh, there are some new strings coming up with Abbey Road one. Um, uh, but I use a lot of the old Speedfire strings. That library was great. I use uh, some of the old Speedfire chamber strings as well. Um, the, the depth of sampling in those libraries was pretty good. So when you for for when you want more specific, uh, tremolo sul porticello, you know half section, um, violas, it's there, right? So when you want that, that kind of a specificity, um, then you would need another library like like that one. And I like when they created that product because it was one thing and you have everything. Now they create, you have to pay for everything, right? They've got the uh, Abbey Road one, you know, violins Abbey Road one violins one, and then uh, that now they've got another like um. You know, they they're coming up with another strings library uh, for like softer thing, softer textures from, from Abbey Road One. So you, you have to buy you know, bits and pieces, and it gets expensive. So to me, it's a combination. To me personally, it's a combination of Cinematic Studio Strings, the old Spitfire Strings Orchestra, the Contact version. And I'm not saying the new ones are are not good; they are fantastic. And um, and then some Cine Cine Strings. Uh, the Cinematic Studio Strings is for legatos and long notes, and most of the things is the the, the one that I use for seventy percent of the things. Uh, the all the Speedfire I use for uh, kind of like the long notes, I mean the extended textures or extended articulations for long notes. I like it very much. Um, and plus, it got got recorded in 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 our studios with that you know bigger, more wet sound, which for sometimes for long notes uh, works great. And then Cine Strings, I still use it for kind of like uh, I wish I had my template loaded, but for the more bite and aggression for the staccatos. Uh, sometimes I have the Cinematic Studio strings with the staccatos, and then for the accents, I will layer some of the Cine, cine strings spiccatos on top, so for, for just for the accents. So th those are the, the my main three strings, um, being CSS, what the about first Project, one. Project Project Sam, do you like anything from them? Project Sam, I use Symphobia for for that more aggressive sound sometimes. Um, so for example. Um, uh, for uh, for aggression for aggression and size in the staccatos, I sometimes use uh, some of the Project Sam uh, Symphobias. 
But uh, other than that, I don't use much. I, I used to use uh, the percussion from Project Sam. Thank you. Yep. Pablo. Hey, Mark. ¿Qué pasa? Was. Um, Muy bien. So, um, instrumentation, so orchestration, uh, after you are done with the sketch, how do you approach instrumentation? Do you, how, mu how much time do you usually devote to this? And do you come back on a different day uh, to orchestrate with fresh ears or not necessarily? Good question. Fantastic question. So generally when I am, that's a fantastic question. I, so two, two scenarios, Gener most of the music that I write is uh, for films. And so the sketch, sometimes it is, the sketch can take three, three, there's three tiers of a sketch. Sometimes to me, in a scoring scenario, a sketch can be literally just setting the markers, right? Um, and then some, okay, here we're going to be in this key and then here we're going we're gonna to modulate. And then I start composing and orchestrating at the same time. Sometimes for more uh, developed type of music or more nuanced type of music, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to need to do a sketch, which is basically just some chords and the melody. And sometimes I need a full blown sketch where I have, you know, every little detail and I actually have to write down, so uh, write down things on paper. Um, and so if that, if that is the case, um, generally I do the sketch, and the sketch helps me with um, kind of like writing down the nuances that I would that I would not be able to record live, uh, and so it's just spending time on the sketch. Let's say it's kind of like an uh, adventure type of adventure music, a la John Williams, where there's like lots of you know harmonic changes. Um, and so I, to me, I'm, I'm, I think I'm better at orchestration than I am at harmony. Let's put it this way. And so I need to have everything written uh, melodically, harmonically, and and then I can start orchestrating directly on the sequencer. I usually do the sketch as fast as possible. Um, depending on the nuance of the music, I spend more or less time on the on perfecting that the sketch because then all the music is going to evolve from there. But to me, the most important thing are harmonic like harmonic changes, temp uh, tempo and markers. Right, I need the structure, structure and harmonic changes are the, which is a structure at the end of the day are the two important things. When I've got that figured out, then I can start orchestrating. Next day, no, generally. Um, I would like for a like a um like a seven minutes like the, the typical the typical kind of like climax moment of the movie with that more intense or action uh, scene where like seven minutes of music where you're like okay this is gonna take some time to write generally it's going to take me about one to two hours to set the markers and like establish the basic structure um and then depending on the style i'll start composing right away um because action high intensity type of music is something that comes through naturally to me and i can start composing but sometimes as i'm composing i'll move forward with a quick sketch and then orchestrate move forward with a quick sketch and orchestrate but first i need to have this structure very well defined so structure uh, I, I Maybe yeah. So no, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. A structure, maybe basic key like modulations harmonically if it needs to be, and then they start composing. Um, because it's like like a follow-up question. Sometimes it's difficult, at least for me, not to get lost down the rabbit hole of you know tons of different timpani sounds with uh, soft mallets, the hard mallets, grid mallets. You know, it's like. How do you avoid that? Because at the end of the day, we want to be efficient. And yeah. you tend, I mean, something I admire of what you do is that you compose fast and and I don't. <laughs> I would say here's where the, it's, a, it's more of a mindset, mindset 
uh, than, than the actual skill of composing fast or not. Uh, I can compose fast. I've been sitting in front of a screen for, you know, for the longest time. And so sequence, I can move fast. I can move fast. I, I've got my template that I've been using for, you know, for a decade. So this is my tool. I can move fast. That's, that's, that's no question. I could move faster. I've seen compose, compose, like you should see, now I'm not comparing myself to, but uh, if, like you seeing Harry Gregson Williams compose and, and it, it feels effort, like it's so, it feels so effortless. He's just composing and then he's written, you know, two minutes of music and, you know, it's, it's just, it's just amazing. Um, but seeing composer compose fast inspired you to up, you know optimize your system and compose fast. But to your question, uh, how you know not go down the rabbit hole and uh, when to stop, when to move on to the next section? And I think it's more of a mindset thing than a skill um, thing. It is it's not the craft; it's more mindset. And I think here's where the three egos come into place. Like, why am I doing this? Okay, I'm so like when to stop is the answer to of when to stop comes from why am I doing this? The, the answer to when to stop comes from why am I doing this? And so if I was trying to recreate, for example, if I am scenario number one, scenario number two and three, scenario number one, I, I am transcribing an orchestral, uh, an, a real orchestral classical piece and I want to sound as close as possible. Scenario number two, um, I am composing for a movie and uh, there's no time, there's, there's no recording with orchestra. Number three, I'm doing a mock-up, but then it's going to be, most of it's going to be replaced. Scenario number one, I'm doing this and the goal is to get as close as possible. So I may I may spend so much more time uh, trying to recreate the orchestral sound, recreating realistic orchestral sound with sample libraries is tough just because sample libraries are not an orchestra. It's a different instrument. So you can recreate if you understand the new and that's how you learn orchestration. Or, or a way to learn orchestration. You are recreating this, but it takes time because you have to, you, you, you're going to hear some nuances that are not in the sample. You're going to have to start stacking uh, in articulation, things like this. And, and it is, it's a never ending, right? Because you're trying to, to get close to a to a recording, to a real record or orchestral recording, which happens to be that particular one. Then if, you know, it's like whatever, like it's the, you know, Beethoven's fifth or whatever, right? There's another Beethoven's fifth recorded with the London field and that's going to sound different. You're like, oh crap. But you're trying, like, so anyway, it's, it's going to be a never ending process of trying to sound. So you're going to go way down, more down to the rabbit hole. If it's scenario number two, which is I'm composing music for this particular, you know, for this movie and there's no recording with an orchestra, when am I going to move forward? When, why? Like, why am I doing this? I am doing this music so I, so the music elevates the scene in a good way, right? And what does the scene need? Well, in this particular case, let's use the other example. It's a, it's a, it's a climatic moment. There's this chase, it's an action high intensity. The music needs to add intensity. Okay, cool. As long as the music adds intensity, when this goal is met, we can move on to the next thing. We can add intensity with, you know, an ostinato and some hybrid pulses. Doesn't need to sound realistic. We cannot, not, we cannot, we're not going to record with an orchestra. So I can do things that an orchestra wouldn't be able to do. Let's just get this done soon as, as quick as possible with the best result possible and in a way that convinces the director in a good way. So when, when you look at the screen and the music is doing what it's supposed to be doing, then you can move on to the next section. And then, uh, the num, num, and, and, but we may go down the rabbit hole, rabbit hole a little more because we need to, for this music to sound professional and this is the final sound. So you're going to be perfecting a little bit more things. So panning EQ, balance, everything has to be mastering, needs to be perfected because the final sound, no one's going to mix your music. No, the music is going to be recorded. In scenario number three is where you're going to move faster. Then you're, you're Michael Giacchino style, right? You are going to be able to compose the whole lost episode in one afternoon, which is what he was able to do, right? He sits down, you know, we are in season six or whatever. He knows his themes, he's everything, right? And then on Thursday, they record on Warner with the same ensemble that they've always recorded. Then the way the, the way he does the mock-up is more like kind of sketch than, than an actual mock-up, right? And then you can write faster. Mock-up is not even a mock-up. It's like an, an idea of what's going to sound when we record with an orchestra. On Thursday, we go record the Warner Bros with the same ensemble we've recorded for over the past six years and it's going to be done and so that then he doesn't go down the rabbit hole because he's 
you know, he's Michael Giacchino. At this point, I've composed the music. I need to move. I need to be efficient. And bam, 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 you know, 40 minutes, you know, not 40, but maybe like 25 minutes of music done in one afternoon. Is it the type of music that you're writing? No, it's kind of like an orchestral sketch kind of thing. Uh, so it's the why. The why answers mm -hmm. the when to stop, I would say. Thank so, you, Mark. Yeah, great question. Okay. We good for today? Two hours? I think it's good. Hey, if you've got the, any more questions, please post them in the group. I'll be active and answering these questions. Um, and as always, I appreciate you all being here. I hope that uh, this was uh, helpful or at least entertaining. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be in front of you. Uh, you know, you know, we are all nerds and uh, you allowed me to talk about these things that we love so much. Uh, so I hope that you had a, a great one. Uh, have a, I hope that you had a, a good holiday season. And I will see you next week. We're going to be composing life uh, with the template that we've been creating over the past few weeks. All right. Thank you so, so much. Have a great one. Thank Talk you, to Mark. Bye-bye. You see you guys. Hasta Thank ahora. you, Bye-bye. See ya. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.